Veja a importância de nós trabalharmos a mente. See how important it is for us to work on our mind, to focus our mind on more elevated things. A person is saying that four times she dreamt about a plane that traveled along streets and highways, and only occasionally, very rarely, did the plane fly. The person in this case is being shown that the plane, which is her mind, needs to stop going along the ground. It has to stop traveling on the earth. The mind was made for flying. The plane was made for flying. So four times she dreamt of the airplane which kept on going along the ground and did not fly. So this is an invitation, a sign, for her to focus her mind on other matters that are different to the ones she is presently focusing. And many times a person asks, what is it that I have to do? After all, I think in a normal way. It is precisely because you think in an ordinary way that your plane travels along the ground. This is the ordinary mind, the concrete mind. And if you are only concerned with external things, if you are only concerned with objective things, and if you always apply your mind to worldly matters, matters concerned with life, with people, with things, all of this is the ground, it is the road. So you have to begin to have another correlation with this mind. You need to take care of concrete things for whatever time is necessary, but do not remain there. This airplane needs to take off. This airplane needs to fly. And you have to be concerned with matters of the spirit, matters of the soul, subtle things, inner things, until this correlation changes. Because when the plane is in the air, when it is flying, that is, when the mind has been well trained, most of the time you are applying your mind to inner things, even while you are engaged in concrete matters. But you never let your mind become totally focused on concrete things. When the mind is taken up with those external things, with human matters, with worldly things, you have to have at least a corner of it turned towards those other things that are moving, those other things which are being focused upon. And the regeneration of the mind is precisely this process. So instead of you're just thinking about concrete things, thinking only about physical things, thinking only about life, that life which everybody lives, thinking only about this, you have to begin to fill this space with other things, with other thoughts, another life, another type of being, another quest. So this gradually begins to take up more space. And when this non-material, non-physical part, this non-human part, is quite redimensioned in the mind, and the greater part of the mind is now dedicated to other things, to other matters, to other planes, to other levels, then at this point a real process of transmutation of the mind begins to take place. And here the mind stops being that windmill that is constantly manufacturing all of this that you see within your mind so that it can become something very serene, like a mirror that begins to reflect higher ideas and thoughts. But this airplane was really made to fly. It was not meant to remain on the ground. There are many people who find it very complicated to start flying with all that is going on around them, because all that is taking place around is not going to help that airplane take off. Rather, it is going to hold the plane down here. So this is very simple. No matter what happens, instead of your mind only paying attention to that, your mind should be looking at what happens and asking itself, well now, what is this trying to tell me? There. Right away, you get out of any involvement. So something that is completely concrete may be taking place, but if your mind looks at it and asks itself, what is this trying to tell me, or what is this showing me, 
then your mind has immediately disengaged itself. It is already on another level. So what is happening continues its process, but your mind is now looking at it and it is in contact with it in a different sense. It sees what is going on, but not to become identified with it. It observes what is occurring in order to see what is the meaning, what is being pointed out, and eventually it does perceive what is being shown. And when it sees what is being indicated, it right away changes. And as soon as the mind becomes transformed, what was happening no longer holds the attention of the mind, regardless of what may be taking place. The mind looks at what is going on, sees it all, but this no longer draws its, its attention. It no longer holds the mind focused on it. So no matter what is happening to you or around you, if your mind looks at it and says, what is this trying to tell me? And then it ends up discovering what it is. When this is discovered, the mind makes the necessary shift and then that will appear to continue to exist for you but it really no longer exists for you it no longer touches you it no longer touches you because it has already done what is meant to do for you you changed as soon as you recognized what was it was trying to tell you so what is happening goes on, but to you it is as though it no longer existed. The mind needs to learn this game so that it can gradually transcend itself and gradually go up to another level and focus its attention, its viewpoint, on levels that are less and less material. Because if the mind is well trained to perceive what is hidden, to perceive what is non-material, to perceive what is non-evident, what is concealed in situations, in people, in beings. If the mind becomes used to observing and seeing the inner aspect, this mind will become increasingly freed from many influences. It will become freed from many influences and will end up focusing on inner things and turning to its inner level. But this work of asking, what is this trying to tell me, is very basic for this process of the mind for the mind to become elevated. You have seen how many times when we are gathered here for a lecture, something happens and everyone looks there to see what is going on. I don't know if in 300 people there is a single one who is asking, what is this telling me? But everybody quickly looks to see what is happening. This is the common mind. This is precisely the ordinary mind. So when someone says something that hurts you, the normal mind hears it and feels hurt. The mind that is following this path of transformation does not get hurt. The mind hears what is said and asks, what is that telling me? What is my role in this? This is very different. And this is very important because if what happens affects you and hurts you, you become marked you feel injured. This is not good because then you have to erase this mark. You have to resolve this scar. So it is very important for the mind to be prepared for this more evolutionary life. So no matter what happens, what is that trying to tell me? And then you gradually solve this. And what is happening will not leave a mark on you because you are busy with your transformation you are busy seeking to understand what is being indicated for this transformation. Someone is asking, how can we stop letting our mind be influenced by all these things around us, especially in this Western world and in the big cities? So, the process is the same in all cases. It is for you to uplift your mind, to look towards, to focus on that which is higher, that which is more elevated, and to spend the least time possible observing negative things. You look at negative things only long enough to recognize them. You do not need to focus on them at length. You see, and take note of something negative, then stop, you ask, can I help? Then do help. If not, stop. 
take note and then move on, do not dwell on it. Because if you constantly focus on the negative, whether in yourself or in things, it becomes very complicated for you to uplift your mind. Someone here has raised a question about initiations, wondering if she had been initiated or if initiations were something that was very common, very normal. And she also asks, what would be the visible signs of initiation? Well, one of the signs of initiation, one of the very deep signs which initiations produce is silence. So someone who experiences an expansion of consciousness in principle should already be living the law of silence. So no, no one ever hears an initiate say he or she is an initiate. One never hears this. Someone who says he or she is an initiate perhaps does not really understand exactly what is being said because the law of silence is a basic, a fundamental law for this, for us to be in this kind of development, preparing for this. Not only do we have to learn to keep silence about all things, but principally silence about ourselves. All those people who feel the need to talk about themselves, to tell things about themselves, to unburden, to confess, all these people need to learn the law of silence, all this has to be trained until they really only say what is necessary and only when it is for the good, when it will help. To talk about oneself only during those few occasions, those very rare occasions when it is right to talk about oneself. Sometimes to stimulate with one's own experience I really don't know because to talk about oneself is something so far removed that I don't really know what it is. But silence is fundamental for those expansions of consciousness. Another point is willingness to serve, willingness to serve and acceptance of all types of purification. So when we are being purified, we complain. We defend ourselves, we protect ourselves. This is very natural. Now, on the path of these expansions of consciousness, for us to experience these expansions of consciousness, we would have to consider purification as our main recourse, as the main key for these expansions to happen. So someone who is getting ready for this, or someone who is already prepared for this, does not fear, does not complain about, does not become dismayed with any type of purification that he or she may be experiencing. And these purifications are also physical, organic, because the cells, the bodies, have to become more permeable, more sensitive. The bodies have to learn to respond to a higher vibration. So organic purification, physical purification, is also necessary. And those who are preparing for an expansion of consciousness know inwardly that this purification is necessary. And they will really be very reticent to talk about this. They will be the least likely to complain, the last ones to protest, because they know what this means. So you can see that this path is not for everyone, because as soon as something begins to get uncomfortable, we begin to lose our balance, we try to rectify it, we begin to run away from certain purifying things. So this means that we are on the path of purification, but not on the path of initiation. On the path of initiation we face the same things as everyone else, but our attitude is completely different. Our attitude is one of silence in face of what happens. This does not mean merely not to speak, but to keep inner silence as well. You are being purified, you are being tested, you are going through a trial, 
and you are not afraid even inwardly. You are not alarmed even inwardly. You do not protest even inwardly. So all of that is part of a purifying process. All that is part of a necessary cleansing process that is absolutely necessary for your bodies to be able to receive a more powerful energy. So by receiving a more powerful energy, you can broaden your field of service. And do not nurture mental conflicts when they appear. Do not nourish them. And keep up positive thoughts. This is very important while we have not yet entered this kind of development, while positive thoughts do not yet prevail in us, and while we have mental conflicts, which always happen, because the mental body is formed from cells that came from the general repository of atoms, and in this genetic code there is still such a thing as heredity, so our mental body may function in a way that is not compatible with our consciousness. Our consciousness may perceive things in our mental body that are inappropriate, and this is perfectly natural, because the mental permanent atom is our own from the beginning, but all the rest of the mental body is made up of atoms that came from all other places. So we have to learn not to incite the conflicts that emerge here. The conflicts that happen in the mental body may not be ours. Those conflicts occur there, those situations emerge there because the atoms are heterogeneous, because the mental body is on a ray that is different to the ray of the soul, different to the ray of the monad. So these are interplays of energy, interplays of rays, in which we should not become involved. It is the same thing if you have some pain in your lungs and become involved with that. If your lungs are hurting, you deal with the pain, you do something about it, but you do not become mixed up with it, because you are not your lungs. Your lungs are hurting, you are not your lungs, you are something else. So you do not become entangled with this. And mental conflicts are like this. Mental illnesses that take place in the areas of the mind are like this. In most cases, these things are, do not even correspond with our consciousness. So on the ordinary path, the path for people in general, all of this is very disturbing. And people's lives are engrossed in this, these conflicts, these vibrations, all of this. But on the path of initiation, when we are getting ready for an initiation, this becomes very evident. And all this interplay becomes so evident that we finally resolve to really avoid getting caught up in our own conflicts. Our own conflicts have various causes, various interpretations, but we are not those. So on the path of initiation, on the path of preparation for the initiations, our mental, emotional and physical etheric bodies must have already been trained. They must have learned to be what they really are in our consciousness without becoming involved with the conflicts that exist in them, within their cells, within their structures and so forth. These expansions of consciousness do not take place only when we seek them, or when we expect them, or when we desire them. The same process of an expansion of consciousness in us also happens with planets. A planet also has expansions of consciousness. Right now, this planet is preparing. It is on the threshold of an initiation. Since the planet is on this path, since it is about to experience an expansion of consciousness to undergo an initiation, everything that is on this planet is also receiving the energy for this expansion. So if we are on a planet that is preparing for an expansion of consciousness, evidently the humanity that is on this planet may also be preparing for expansion. This humanity has all the conditions to prepare for this. And this can be seen in the level of chaos all around. 
it can be seen in the level of suffering that is present deep within this humanity, especially in certain regions of the earth. All of this is a cleansing, all of this is a purification that has all the appearances, all the characteristics of being an expansion of consciousness for all humanity. When we refer to an expansion of consciousness for all humanity, for humanity as a whole, it may possibly not happen to every single being. Those humans who cannot undergo that expansion of consciousness will eventually be conducted to other levels or directed towards other worlds that will go on preparing them. But we who are on a planet that is presently preparing for this, we are automatically on this path of preparation. So it would be good if we could be able to look at our trials and to understand the situations which are mandatory for us within this frame of reference, because it may be that we are undergoing certain tests that we are experiencing certain situations that are putting us through a certain cleansing, through a certain purification. And here yes, someone says that on page 142 of the book, Unveiled Secrets, it is stated that there is a difference between the process of an expansion of consciousness on the surface of the earth and that of the intraterrestrial humanity. But for both cases, that is to say, in all cases, for us to have an expansion of consciousness, the esoteric lexicon states that we have to have an external stimulus. Nobody undergoes that expansion of consciousness alone. In natural evolution, people do go through expansions on their own, but when they begin to get into other kinds of evolution, as for example the path of the initiations, they cannot take this step alone. This is what the lexicon is saying, and this means that when we are ready to enter this path, a ray, an energy, begins to stimulate us for this in a special way either the ray of that mental, emotional, or physical etheric body that is least prepared, or the ray of that body that has to start the movement of expansion of consciousness. So there is always a specific ray energy or grouping of ray energies that stimulate us in a special way. When certain rays begin to stimulate us, when certain energies begin to stimulate us, and these can even be the energies of our own monad or of our own soul, when these energies begin to stimulate us for this, sometimes our bodies, our mental, emotional and physical etheric vehicles are not prepared to receive this special stimulation. However, this has to take place because it is preordained in the person's life. Yet he or she must not be burned by a stimulus that is greater than the body's can receive at that time. So there is a way for this to happen, which is, for a member of the hierarchy, a being or a consciousness, to become the intermediary for the energy of that ray, an intermediary between that stimulus and the individual. So the individual does not fail to receive the stimulus, does not fail to receive the impulse, but is protected by this entity or by this consciousness which is there close by and is accompanying this process. These consciousnesses or beings once had very positive experiences with us. They are beings or consciousnesses which had served in the past and after that consciousness evolved after that consciousness was transformed, it can now come to serve as hierophant. And this consciousness can come to serve as a filter for those moments in which we have to receive a greater impulse. This consciousness that comes to help us 
to receive this also stimulates us. The mere presence of this consciousness already stimulates an expansion of consciousness because the ray, the energy, gives of itself there since it can depend on the support of this consciousness in order for the matter to be able to bear all of this. So, in effect, this event of expansion does not exist without this outside help. Without getting into comparisons, because this is something different, but still in the same subject, you have read in the book, Signs of Contact, that in order for many things to take place there, it was necessary to have a being outside one who would serve as hierophant, who would serve as intermediary, so that certain things could take place. So in all important moments of our lives, in all the very basic stages of our evolution, we need to have this external stimulus. External is a way of expressing it. It may be a consciousness, it may be a more evolved being, or a circumstance that comes to give us a specific stimulus at that moment so that we may be in condition to receive this expansion. Those who stimulate us or those who support us in the process of expansion of our consciousness are consciousnesses, they are beings, who have been linked to us in a karmic way since the beginning. They are always beings who are very well known to us, but who are at a different level of development. A story comes to mind that might show this. Someone had undergone one or two expansions of consciousness, and she needed to receive a third. But in order to have this third expansion, she needed to have a physical contact face to face with somebody who was more advanced than she. So one day she received a phone call. Are you going out today? She was asked by someone she knew. No, I'm going to be at home. Oh, very good, because Paul Brunton is going there. Paul Brunton happened to be in the city at that time. She said, who? Paul Brunton is coming here. Yes, he's going there this afternoon. When the time came, Paul Brunton appeared. She opened the door and he went in. The two of them sat and talked for a while. He asked her some questions. They talked a bit. After a while, he got up and left. He just got up and left. Well, from that moment onward, a kind of transformation took place in the person. This means that an expansion of consciousness had to take place, but she was not able to do it on her own. So she had to have somebody who had already gone through that. Paul Brownton went there and had a trivial conversation with her, and when she told me this story, I asked her, So, did Paul Brunton know you? And she said, No, I knew Paul Brunton through reading his books. I knew about him. But no, in this lifetime we had never met. So I remarked, Oh, so then you were unfamiliar to him. And she said, Oh, no, only in this lifetime. But for many lifetimes I was a student of his. I washed his clothes, or I cooked for him, I learned from him. In this lifetime, he said, I'm going there. He came, that was it. Something like this usually happens. Well, I have given a very minimal account, but it happened somewhat like that. And someone is asking to say something about the dark nights of the soul. What we call the dark night of the soul is perceived after we have lived a phase in which we had some knowledge of the soul. For those who have not yet lived the soul consciously, there is no dark night of the soul. We have to have consciously lived the soul for this. We have to be already living the life of the soul in order to perceive when a dark night begins. 
Because the soul is learning to communicate with the spirit. The soul is learning how to communicate with the monad. And there are certain things in this interrelationship between the soul and the monad which the soul conveys to the consciousness. And there are other things it does not convey. That which the soul passes on to the consciousness is transformed into the person's inner life. It is transformed into the spiritual life, the inner life of that being. So the individual is already used to, to receiving these reflections coming from the interrelationship between the soul and the spirit. So this is what we mean by the individual living the life of the soul. Now, in this interrelationship between the soul and the spirit, there are some phases in which the soul does not really understand what is happening. There are other phases in which the spirit controls what can reach the soul's consciousness. That is to say, this interrelationship between the soul and the spirit does not always happen with the same clarity from the point of view of the soul. And there are times when the soul is a little left on its own so that it can develop certain forces and also learn to see through faith without being guided by the spirit. So at this point, when the soul is experiencing these processes of being on its own, it will probably concentrate on its own matters. And those who are used to living the life of the soul in a conscious way will find themselves living the dark night because they are not living anything at all. The soul is not conveying anything to them because at that moment the soul is also resolving its own situation of being left on its own. So during the dark night of the soul, for example, we have no dreams about the inner life during the dark night of the soul, we have no visions, we have no intuitive knowledge, we receive no impressions. Nor all these things that we were formerly used to having. So our perception begins to feel a void, as though we were empty inside of ourselves. And while we had this inner strength, we had this fire, we had this light, we could feel this presence. We knew it, that it was there. So when the soul is withdrawn into itself, when the soul is resolving this matter of its expression, of its dialogue, of its relationship with the spirit, it is there turned inward and working inwardly on that. These are not issues for the human consciousness. So there is a sort of void there. There is no perception of inner life. There is no confirmation that you have an inner life. You feel as if you had been stripped of any understanding of the spiritual life, of any sensitivity. You find yourself in a very dry, arid situation. This is very painful for the senses. The senses find this very uncomfortable, very painful. Not only the outer senses, but also the inner senses, those inner senses of ours that perceive things inwardly. Those sen senses feel completely unseated when this happens. And the mind also, because the mind no longer has the same clarity. No matter where the mind turns, it finds nothing but that aridity. It finds only that lack of response. It finds only something unexplainable. But since this is a soul, since this, this is a being that is already on the path, it has faith. So this is the time to use faith. Faith exists for moments such as these. Faith exists to keep us firm. Faith exists to keep us in balance at the very time when these inner workings cease for a while, when these inner workings into, not really into withdrawal, but, but into a different rhythm. This is what faith is for. 
Of course, those who enter a dark night already know what faith is. They have already worked on their faith and now they discover that what matters here is faith. So we go through a dark night, we go through a period without any awareness of what is happening inside, of what is happening in the reality of things. We go through these dark nights sustained by faith. There is no other way to go through this experience. There is no other way to go through this night. And these phases in which we become somewhat unaware of what is happening within us, of all these things which were really our life, a phase like this for us can be quite long. It can vary according to the value of that night. It can vary according to that which is occurring between the soul and the spirit. Amongst the things we learn when we go through those phases in pure faith, because there is really nothing to support us, there is nothing to sustain us, because these are inner things, it is no use offering any help, because this is all within you, so there is no way out except through faith. Here it is faith and nothing else. You must remain in faith and keep on going in faith. The result of this dark night, of this experience, the inner spiritual result is very deep. After a dark night, the soul is much closer to the monad. The contact between the soul and the monad is much more thorough. But on the level where we are conscious, on the level where we live, the immediate and tangible result of the dark night is for our consciousness to become impartial to everything. So if one's consciousness is confronted with something which it, it considers real and then suddenly it faces something that it considers illusory, it remains impartial. Consciousness has no ups and downs. You can be facing anything and your consciousness remains impartial. The consciousness does not alter. Consciousness is not disturbed. So you can be faced with something that is considered good or something that is considered bad. You see the difference between these, but your consciousness is not disturbed. Consciousness is completely impartial. Once consciousness shifts one, from one thing to something else that is opposite with impartiality, without losing its balance, this is the result of the dark nights. This is what comes after the dark night. This is what the consciousness learns by having walked in faith, since faith does not ask for explanations. During that phase of dryness, you do not ask anything. And this is very important, because to ask a question and expect a reply is a waste of time. If you have faith, you move forward without questioning, and thus you advance more rapidly. This is very mysterious, and someone who has not developed faith and does not live in faith finds this dreadful. But this is how it is on this level. This is the level of faith. 